I thought I'd start with a definition, which is an, an Austrian definition of competition, which is uh, very different than any definition you've seen if you've ever taken a microeconomics course, I think. And uh, there's a short, uh, snappy definition. And uh, what it says, if you can't see it from the back there, I think I tried to write kind of big, as competition is a dynamic, rivalrous, entrepreneurial process of discovery that facilitates planned coordination among market participants to their mutual advantage. It's kind of a mouthful, but I think it says what the Austrian view of competition is in one sentence. And I have some other sentences from Friedrich Hayek I'm going to read to you in a minute. But uh, if you look at this, what, is it, what it means is it's really competition viewed as uh, the man on the street. I won't say the woman on the street. It sounds too much like streetwalker or hooker or something. But the man on the street views competition, real world competition. It's dynamic, which means it's ongoing. It's, it's always ongoing. Uh, rivalrous. Well, it's rivalry. That's, that's competition. It's like sports rivalry, business rivalry. Entrepreneurial. Uh, the lifeblood of competition is entrepreneurs who are uh, ever alert for profit opportunities, whether it's buying low and selling high, uh, uh, fulfilling a market niche that others have overlooked, or just filling that niche faster than others have. Uh, those are some of the basic things entrepreneurs do. And we really could use a separate class just on the economics of entrepreneurship. And, uh, uh, but if you want to read up on it, Human Action by von Mises has, has uh, a lot of good uh, 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 wise things to say about the role of the entrepreneur. In fact, in the famous uh, uh, socialist calculation debates of the 1920s and 30s that Mises and Hayek participated in, one of the things that's been overlooked by uh, the critics of the Austrians, the, the pro-communists, like Oscar Lange, the commie Oscar Lange, uh, was the role of the entrepreneur. Uh, uh, Mises stressed, for example, that if you have a proper understanding of the market process, you understand that it's the entrepreneurs who drive the whole process. And in order to have prop entrepreneurs, you need private property, you need uh, market prices, you need the free market. You can't have entrepreneurs under socialism, for example. They just don't exist. And so without this entrepreneurial class with the accumulated wisdom of what that class of people does, it's impossible to have a well-functioning or even a functioning economy. That was a really important part of the, the socialist calculation debate of the early 20th century. And, but it's, it's left out in most discussions. So it's an entrepreneurial process of discovery. Now, the word discovery, uh, that's also very important uh, in distinguishing the Austrian view of competition from the mainstream or neoclassical view, because a lot of the things that are just assumed to exist in the neoclassical model, firms price equal to marginal cost, uh, firms uh, uh, pick the lowest point in the long run average cost curve and, and decide to have that scale of plant. These are all things that are discovered through trial and error on the marketplace. Uh, they're not known to anyone, to any economist or to any, any genius somewhere in advance. They're revealed to us through the marketplace. That's why the Austrian view stresses that the market is a discovery process. Uh, for example, when you see a lot of mergers, corporate mergers, that five, ten years later don't really work out and they're spun off, the, the company sells a, a, some, a, a separate company that might have acquired ten years earlier. Uh, a lot of economists uh, will use that example to say mergers are wasteful, they, we need more regulation of mergers. Well, what has happened here is somebody who put their own money up and their own career on the line uh, made a bad decision. And how do we know it's a bad decision? Well, the market told us that. But that's the only way to know what the most efficient structure of industry is and is not, is to do it, to let the market do it. And so. Uh, and any kind of business tactic, business strategy, pricing strategy, uh, or anything, uh, we discover that through the market. We discover what works and what doesn't. We don't know it in advance. Facilitates plan coordination between buyers and sellers, among other things. And of course, the market is mutually advantageous. Uh, that's why the market is, um, in free market competition, is inherently cooperative. Uh, after all, a corporation, what is a corporation? It's a group of individuals who band together to cooperate 
to produce some good or service uh, for a profit. It's, it's mutual cooperation. It's or collusion, if you will. They collude together to uh, to form a business. That's uh, that's what that's what a corporation is. Okay, so that's that's a, just a definition of uh, of competition in the Austrian viewpoint. Now, one one of the big differences between the Austrians and um, the neoclassical model on competition is that uh, although the neoclassical economists do incorporate some dynamics into their uh, models or their theories. Um, most of the time, not really, because their ultimate benchmark of uh, of what of how to measure competition is an equilibrium end state, END end state. Uh, well, you know, you all know the conditions: uh, perfect competition, price equals marginal cost equals long run marginal cost. These equilibrium conditions, Pareto optimality. Ultimately, that's the benchmark. Austrians uh, don't look at, at that as necessarily desirable. Uh, why? Because again, they look at uh, competition as dynamic and not static. These are static equilibrium conditions. They're in a static standard model. I guess, uh, I guess my uh, microphone lectures over. Let's go have lunch again. <laughs> uh, this thing fell off. I'll just hold it here. I guess we need some. Oh, here, I can fix it. There. Somebody will come out of this room if they can't. Uh, if there's a problem. With, uh, with, the, with this, when the Wizard of Oz is back there, uh, or a Alan Greenspan will pop out like in, like in, like in Roger Garrison's uh, presentation. Um, now, to give you an idea of what I mean by static versus dynamic uh, competition, in the 1950s and 60s, uh, there began a whole uh, slew of, uh, of papers published on uh, so-called industrial concentration. And one of the measurements of industrial concentration that was uh, quite often used was something called the eight-firm concentration ratio. And all it is simply is the percentage of sales in an industry by the eight biggest firms in terms of sales volume, eight-firm concentration ratio. And uh, there were some researchers at Harvard, mostly, who began this line of research. And, uh, and what they did, basically, was to run simple correlations and find cor uh, correlation coefficients between industrial concentration and profitability. And lo and behold, they found that in quite a few industries where there were higher levels of concentration, there was higher profitability at a point in time. Because after all, these data they were gathering were profit data that were gathered on, on one day, on one particular day by the US Department of Commerce, one day. And so the conclusion they came to was there was cause and effect here. Higher concentration led to higher profitability, and it was more or less assumed. And as far as I know, it was never proven, uh, theorized, assumed that the link was higher concentration made it easier for collusion to take place, and that's what caused the higher profitability. And so, and these data were all just static in that they were data at a point in time, and so uh, there were, and so dozens and dozens of these studies were replicated. And there were all kinds of statistical problems with them, and it created entire careers for many people in uh, producing these studies and criticizing the studies. And these studies have pretty much been thrown away, thrown out as trash, even though I think a lot of people at Harvard made their careers out of these. But one of the, one of the reasons they've been uh, pretty much discarded, for the most part, is a, a lot of research done mostly by the uh, people associated with the University of Chicago that essentially rediscovered the Austrian view of competition. They may not have called themselves Austrians, but they, they started looking at these same data in a dynamic sense like the Austrians always have. And one of the first persons to do this was Yale Brosen, who was at the University of Chicago. And if you want a good overview of this whole body of research, it's Brosen's book. It's B-R-O-Z-E-N is how the name is spelled. His first name is Yale, like Yale University. It's uh, Concentration, Mergers, and Public Policy, the name of the book. It was published in the early 80s, but it's a great survey of all this research and the history uh, up to the early 80s. And one of the first things he did, very simply, was he looked at these data that the Harvard researchers had showing industries based on data that they got from the 1930s and 40s with high concentration and high profitability. And he just simply asked the question, well, does this correlation hold up over time? Uh, how long does this persist? Because the, the, the model of monopoly said 
well, monopoly is monopoly, and this, this is going to persist for quite a long time. And so he got the same exact data, the same exact industries, and, uh, and looked at, well, what happens, uh, what's the correlation today, five years from today, or for five years from that date, ten years, and he found that it totally breaks down, and that the, in the industries where there was above average profitability in one year tended to descend toward the median, uh, the industries where there was below average profitability in that first year tended to ascend toward the, uh, ascend toward the median, and so there was no such link after all between uh, uh, concentration and profitability, if you look at this in a dynamic sense. Because after all, at any one point in time, somebody's got to, got to be at the top. Uh, in any industry, you're always going to have one or a few competitors who are just better than everybody else. That's sort of normal, to, whether it's the National Football League or the computer industry. At any one time, that's true. So if you were to take a snapshot of the computer industry in 1973, uh, you would say, IBM is a monopoly, you know, if you were trained by the Harvard researchers, and it appears that they will always be a monopoly for the foreseeable future, and there's nothing that no one could ever compete with IBM. But of course, by 1983, uh, uh, you know, IBM had been wrapped up in court under an antitrust lawsuit with the federal government at that point for how many years? I think for 12 or 13 years, and the judge uh, died. And so uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Reagan administration said, the hell with it. They gave up on the whole thing. But in the meantime, Microsoft had been created. Who would have ever foreseen that a bunch of college dropouts from Harvard, the same school that produced all these phony baloney studies, um, would create Microsoft? And on, on the uh, LouRockwell.com website last week was this famous picture of Bill Gates and five or six other extraordinarily nerdy looking people <laughs> who created Microsoft. And Gates looks like a 10 year old in, in, the, in the picture. You look at it, it's, I'm sure it's still up there somewhere, you can get it. And, uh, you, and you can't forecast those sorts of things. And so, um, and so Brosen did that and then Harold Demsetz is another big name in this area where he took a look at um, these same exact data uh, uh, by the, with the correlation between concentration and and uh, profitability, and uh, he he discovered that well, what you tended to see here is that within an industry, it wasn't all the, all the firms did not have equal profit rates in the high profit industries. It was the biggest firms had the biggest profit rates, and why is that? Is they had the lowest cost, they had economies of scale, so therefore they had the highest profit uh, profit rates. Because, of course, they had the biggest margin between price and cost. Uh, and so uh, and the conclusion he came to is that the, the, the real cause of this high profitability is that some firms were just better at achieving economies of scale within one industry than others. It wasn't monopoly or conspiracy or collusion or anything like this. It, they were just better competitors than everybody else. And, uh, and therefore, uh, they had uh, more higher profit. Uh, another, one of the things he pointed out was, uh, and he's a very clever guy, and one of the really important points about this whole literature that he pointed out is that whenever you see so, a competitor, a business person, complaining that, or complaining to the government especially, that one of his competitors is a monopoly or has monopoly power, okay, one of the things you, you know from that fact is that the competitor does not have monopoly power. How do you know that? Well, if he did have monopoly power, what does standard economics tell you is happening to price? If, if, if there's monopoly power in an industry, it's going up. Since when would a competitor complain about one of their rival's prices going up? <laughs> if the rival is causing prices to go up, either you can charge a higher price too, or you keep your price where it is and you gain market share because they're charging a higher price. It's only when your competitor is dropping his price that you hear complaints by rivals. We need an investigation. Bill Gates needs to go before Congress. And so it's always, a, a, you know, there's always a, you know, something stinks whenever you see one business person complain that his, his rival is acting monopolistically. Uh, because if the rival was, it would be to the, everybody's benefit in the industry. Uh, if nothing else, if monopolies really, if they restrict output, like the standard model says also, well, that creates market opportunities for the competition to fill in, to expand their output, and to make those sales that the so-called monopolist is not making by restricting his output. And so 
Um, and, and one final uh, point on this, this whole area is that uh, 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 my former colleague Jack High and I published an article a long time ago. It was in the uh, July 1988 Economic Inquiry, an economics journal. The name of the article is Antitrust and Competition Historically Considered. And one of the things, uh, uh, one of the points we make in that article is that uh, when the, the first federal antitrust law, anti-monopoly law, was passed, the Sherman Antitrust Act, uh, named after a gen or not, uh, Senator John Sherman, who was the brother of General William Tecumseh Sherman, uh, uh, virtually the entire economics profession was opposed to it. They were against it. And uh, we, we surveyed the entire economics profession, anybody who had a full-time job as a, an economist, in those days there were only a couple of dozen. So you could actually survey the entire profession, and there were only like one or two people who were for the Sherman Act. Even an avowed socialist uh, like Robert T. Ely, the co-founder of the American Economic Association, was against the Sherman Antitrust Act. Why? Because they all viewed competition, like the Austrians do, as a dynamic rivalrous process, and they saw all these mergers that were happening as just a, a natural consequence. After all, mass production was being introduced, economies of scale were dropping costs and prices. They saw the prices of everything going down. This was a period of deflation in the, in the United States. They thought this was great. And so, uh, you know, well, what's all the complaints? So they were almost uniformly opposed to it. Uh, and, but the economics profession only came to embrace antitrust laws uh, or restrictions on, on mergers for the most part. Uh, really, uh, around the 1920s or 30s. Why? The argument we give is their view of competition changed. The markets didn't change. It didn't become more monopolistic, but they embraced the perfect competition model as their benchmark. Now you needed many firms. Everybody charges the same price, homogeneous products, all the assumptions of perfect competition. That's what competition meant. And so if that's what competition means, well, then you need a Sherman Act. Uh, in fact, we quote George Stigler in a paper he wrote in the Journal of Political Economy in 1965, which was a survey article on the state of the art of the perfect competition model at that time. And we quote him as saying, perfect competition requires a Sherman Act, requires antitrust laws. Uh, and because after all, if, you, if, you, if you've taken a micro course, you've seen those, those assumptions behind the standard neoclassical model, uh, many firms, whatever many is, uh, homogeneous products, homogeneous prices, okay, costless entry and exit, perfect information. There are a few other variants, but usually most of the textbooks include, uh, include, uh, include these things. Now, you know, the standard model uh, was really developed to be primarily a model of price competition, not a model of quality competition or any other kind of competition. And so the assumption behind this model is this. These are the assumptions. And uh, probably the, the the, uh, the one article I usually recommend if people want to read one article on the Austrian view of competition, it's called The Meaning of Competition by Friedrich Hayek, and it's in his little book called Individualism and Economic Order. And Hayek's writing is, is kind of uh, hard to understand sometimes. I mean, he had a kind of a unique way of uh, writing the English language, and the ideas are, are usually uh, intriguing, if not brilliant. But it's just you know it's not always the easiest to read. But and this is one. Of, but this is one of his easier to read articles, the meaning of competition. And let me read you just a few quotes of what he says about you know this is the definition of what constitutes a competitive market. Uh, he said in this article, and I'm quoting, this theory throughout assumes that state of affairs already to exist, which according to the truer view of the older theory, the process of competition tends to bring about. So he's talking about the, the discovery process aspect. And then he goes on to say, if the state of affairs assumed by the theory of perfect competition, this right here, ever existed, 
it would not only deprive of their scope all the activities which the verb to compete describes, but would make them virtually impossible. Okay, so if this ever came about, you wouldn't have any competition. Because after all, real business people compete by differentiating their product. They cut their prices uh, to gain customers. You know, they, they, they're constantly, you know, entry isn't uh, perfectly costless. They don't have perfect information. They advertise like crazy to try to uh, gain market, market share. So all these things would be uh, assumed away. And the conclusion he comes to is competition is, by its nature, a dynamic process whose essential characteristics are assumed away by the assumptions underlying the static analysis of the standard theory. So real competition is really assumed away by the standard model. And I once I published an article once in see when was this? Nineteen eighty seven in Policy Review. This was back when the Her before the Heritage Foundation became a sort of quasi socialistic outfit promoting big government. And it still had a few gen it still had actual pictures of Hayek and Mises on the wall down there. But uh, I'm sure they've torn them down and put Harry Jeff up instead by now. <laughs> But um, um, but uh, one of the things that I did was it was it was on the, the phenomenon of some relatively more free market textbooks dominating the textbook market. At the time, Gortney and Stroop and books like that had eclipsed Paul Samuelson. And so when I did the research, I, I looked through all the past volumes of Samuelson's textbooks beginning in 1948. And this is how certainly Americans and most of the rest of the world was educated in, in introductory economics from 1948 to about 1978. And even all the other books were just clones of Samuelson's book. If, they weren't, if you weren't using Samuelson, you were using a clone of Samuelson's book. And, uh, and on his section on competition in all these years, this of course was his uh, theory of competition, he said uh, the only really competitive industries in America were, I think, natural gas, oh, uh, wheat, and I think that was it. I think I said natural gas and wheat. And because natural gas is homogeneous, if you drill it over here, it's the same stuff as if it was over there. And, uh, and wheat is wheat. And, uh, and, and even with that, he was wrong. Because natural gas is produced mostly by government-sanctioned monopolies, you know, so-called natural monopolies. And the price was the same because the government set the price. <laughs> and uh, wheat, wheat farmers, you know, agriculture is uh, so heavily regulated by the agricultural cartel that it's enforced by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. That's one of the most heavily monopolized industries we have, agriculture. And so, uh, and so he didn't really give his, his students uh, for several generations much, uh, much education of what real competition is. And of course, if, that, if those were the only two competitive industries, you had uh, generations of, of students taught that all of, all of industry is monopoly of one kind or another because it's only wheat and natural gas, it's competition. So that's the kind of idiocy you get when you, when you look at this, this definition and take it seriously. Uh, Robert Bork, uh, um, the famous uh, uh, conservative legal scholar, he taught uh, antitrust law at Yale for some 17 years before going to Washington and pretty much destroying himself. And, uh, but, and he, was a, he was a famous antitrust scholar. He wrote a book called The Antitrust Paradox in 1978, which is considered to be a, somewhat of a classic. And in it, he says, uh, there's one passage there where he says that if the government ever took these assumptions seriously and tried to force them on the US economy, it would have a, roughly the same effect on wealth as several strategically placed nuclear explosions. Knows that's exactly what he what he says on it. So, so, uh, so, he, and so there are a lot of good things in that book. Uh, he he totally repudiated himself though when he became a uh, high paid consultant for the anti Microsoft forces during the whole Microsoft saga. He he was on Novell's payroll, and so all the things that he wrote in his book in 1978 he he repudiated in in uh, making the case against Microsoft because Microsoft was doing all these things that he defended in his 1978 book as efficient. But once he was paid $700 an hour, uh, they're not efficient anymore. They're monopolistic. Uh, and Tom Hazlett, my old friend Tom Hazlett, even confronted Bork on that at a forum at the American Enterprise Institute. 
And he, he pretty much said, so what, according to Tom, anyway. It's, <laughs> but uh, he didn't, Tom thought he was going to really get him, because he had his book in his hand, and he was reading from his own book, and then he was reading a, a recent Wall Street Journal article where he contradicted his own book, and Bork pretty much just said, ah, I changed my mind. <laughs> he didn't, he didn't, he didn't, he just, that's pretty much what he said. Um, so let's take a look at these, um, these assumptions a little more uh, closely. I hope this wasn't the last guy's drink here. I assume it's mine. Uh, take the homogeneous products assumption. Now this, this assumption uh, historically has led to a great deal of mischief. In fact, it, it led to the whole monopolistic competition revolution. I once listened to a talk by Ronald Coase where he's talking about revolutions in economics. And, uh, you know, and, and there have only been a really a, a few really revolutions in, in the economics, a Keynesian revolution. And around the same time, there was the monopolistic competition revolution. And it was in the 1930s, and these two books written by uh, Edward Chamberlain and Joan Robinson, two British economists, pretty much the same on monopolistic competition, which I've always thought of as sort of a, uh, an oxymoron, like jumbo shrimp or military intelligence, <laughs> rap music, uh, uh, country music, I don't, uh, you know, oxymoron. But, you know, the idea was, the basic idea was, in most industries are a combination of competition and monopoly in that, yes, there may be many firms, you know, assumption number one, but they differentiate their products. They don't have homogeneous products. Therefore, if you can differentiate your product or even differentiate it in the minds of consumers through advertising, you can establish yourself as a monopolist by doing that, just by doing that. And so uh, if you read some of the literature of the time, these ec economists like Chamberlain and Robinson and their others were ecstatic that they thought they found a silver bullet uh, to sh be shot into the heart of capitalism because, of course, you know, everybody, it's a di part of differentiation is just a normal part of the competitive process. And, uh, and so they thought that, and so it was pervasive. But if they could argue that, no, it's not, it's not a good thing, it's a bad thing, then capitalism is inherently flawed and must be very heavily and strictly regulated uh, by the government uh, to avoid the, us all being victims of monopolization. And it was not only Chamberlain and Robinson, there was some more, this tradition carried uh, itself forward. In the 1980s, uh, one of the big shots in the economics profession, who's, um, uh, uh, who's still quite a, a prestigious economist. Uh, he's in Germany now. His name is Dennis Mueller. He used to be at the University of Maryland. I think he te he's at, at, uh, somewhere in Berlin now, I think. But I haven't kept up with him. Institute for Management, or something like that. But um, he, uh, he's a real big shot in the field of industrial organization. And he wrote a survey article on industrial organization theory of the firm in the Journal of Economic Literature in the 80s. And, uh, and, and he cited his, a lot of his own work as, as I would do if I were to write an article like that. And one of the things he was doing at the time was uh, uh, writing up a rationale for why we needed a new congressional committee to, to monitor product differentiation and innovation and to, uh, to decide for corporations which innovations would be allowed and which would not because he claimed that some innovations of new products create some sort of dangerous product differentiation that would lead to monopoly, whereas others did not. So we should let the good ones go and, not, and then prohibit the bad ones. And he, he thought this would lead to economic efficiency. And of course, the, uh, apart from uh, what I'm going to say in a minute, part of the reasons why this was an idiotic idea was that if you did have such a committee, of course, the, what would happen would be corporations would spend millions lobbying Congress to prohibit the innovations of their rivals and to allow theirs. That's, that's what businesses do when they go to Washington. And so that would lead to more inefficiency, not, not more efficiency. Uh, but apart from that, there's a fundamental economic mistake that's made here. And then if you look at um, the standard monopoly model, it's in all the textbooks with a, a demand curve, there's marginal revenue, and marginal cost in a constant cost industry. The standard monopoly diagram looks like this. Here's the monopoly price PM and monopoly quantity PM. If this were competitive, 
this would be the, the uh, competitive level of output, marginal cost would be the supply curve if it were competitive, and this supply and demand would give you this equilibrium output in the standard model, and this would be the equilibrium price, PC. And so what the, what the argument basically was uh, that Mueller made and many others have made against product differentiation is that those industries that innovate uh, and become monopolistically competitive, they create uh, an output restriction situation. They're restricting output because if, ev if everybody had the same idea at the same time, okay, if everybody had, say Bill Gates uh, invents a new type of software, that catches on, that's, that's people use. If a thousand people had that idea at the same instant, then this is the output level we would get, QC. However, only Bill Gates has the idea. Therefore, and it may be years before others catch up to him. Therefore, he's, he's, gonna, he's a monopolist. He's the only one with the idea. He's only going to produce this amount because that's what the profit-maximizing monopolist will do. So clearly there's a... a, a an output restriction here, so the argument goes. But the argument is a, an example of what's called the nirvana fallacy. If you compare real world markets to nirvana or utopia, markets are always going to see seem like they're failing, uh, or they're not adequate, because nothing nothing is as good as utopia. Uh, so this is a utopian argument. You know, it's, it's never going to be true that everybody will simultaneously have the same invention at the same time and give you the perfectly competitive level of output. So the, the real comparison ought to be not this. They're comparing nirvana to reality. What they ought to be comparing is reality to the alternative reality. The alternative real reality is no invention at all, zero. So when Bill Gates has this idea, what has he done? He's expanded output from zero to QM. He hasn't shrunk output uh, at all. He's created his invention. And of course, competition always uh, comes in very quickly. And so, uh, and I think that's, that's the standard mistake about this whole line of thinking about why this is a bad idea, why uh, product differentiation is a bad idea. And it's not only in theory. There, there are some famous uh, antitrust cases in America that have been based on this wrong thinking. Um, the most famous case, some of you may have read about this somewhere, is known to antitrust economists as the cereals case. Uh, back in the late 70s, General Mills, General Foods, and Kellogg's were sued by the federal government, by the federal antitrust uh, regulators, for uh, allegedly monopolizing the dry cereal industry in what was called a shared monopoly. There was a new theory created called the theory of shared monopoly. How did they get this shared monopoly? It was through what they said was brand proliferation. Not brand, but brand with a D. Brand <laughs> proliferation. Product differentiation. Well, what was happening was these three cereal companies began experimenting with all kinds of cereal, different kinds of cereal. Uh, granola, Count Chocula, all this <laughs> stuff. And some of it really took off and people loved it because they were bored with plain old cornflakes and Cheerios. And so uh, as a result, they gained a big market share, whereas their competitors, who did not put all this money into marketing research and innovation and new product creation, lost market share to them. So these three companies had over 70% of the dry cereal market. And this theory was uh, of shared monopoly based on the evils of product differentiation was dreamt up by Friedrich Scherer, S-C-H-E-R-E-R, -E -E who at the time was the author of the, the most widely used industrial organization textbook in, in the United States. And uh, so he was another, uh, he was at Harvard then too, of course. Uh, same, same cabal, uh, same, same group of, uh, same cartel, I guess. And so he dreamed this up. Uh, it cost these companies, of course, millions of dollars, uh, uh, thousands and thousands of hours spent in court rather than managing their business. It eventually was thrown out, uh, uh, you know, so that the cereal companies won. But with antitrust, when you win, you always lose because you had to spend millions and you had to divert management time to defending yourself uh, against, uh, you know, bogus charges. And I think this was the one case where the judge uh, actually made the comment that, uh, well, I eat bacon and eggs in the morning. So, so uh, in other words, so what, even if they did raise the price of dry cereal, there are plenty of substitutes out there, bagels, muffins, everything else. Uh, 
they wouldn't be able to raise their price. They would have to keep the price down to compete with all these substitutes. They defined the market too narrowly, is, is what they did. So this is not just a theoretical problem. Um, let's see, with, um, how about homogeneous prices? The, the assumption of homogeneous prices that's in the mo standard model outlaws price cutting, as Hayek said in the quotation I gave you, all the normal activities of uh, competition are outlawed, and it just outlaws price cutting. And so uh, it outlaws all kinds of uh, competitive price changing. Uh, when I lived, I lived in downtown Baltimore once, and uh, before they stole my car and my garbage cans and my bicycle and all everything else, and, uh, and charged me double the taxes that I pay now, so I decided to leave. Um, uh, but um, but they, every time a new pizza joint would open up, uh, you'd get brochures in the mail for something ridiculous bargain, like uh, a large pizza with everything, 32-ounce Coke and a sub sandwich for $6.95 or something like that. It lasts about a week. They just wanted to get you in the door. They, uh, they had to be losing money on this. But they wanted to get you in the door, try out their pizza, because after all, there's, there's all these other pizza place. There's Little Italy. Little Italy was three blocks away where you can get all this homemade pizza. And so they wanted to get you in the door, try it out, and then after a couple of weeks they'd charge the, the going rate for a large pizza and a sub sandwich and, and all this thing. That's a normal competitive device. There were probably hundreds of places within a two mile radius to buy pizza there. Uh, so it's ridiculous to think that this would be uh, anti-competitive. Okay, it's, it's normal, normal thing. Uh, on, but by the way, on the topic of product differentiation, that's why I handed out this piece of paper. This is a study by the Dallas uh, Fed of product differentiation in more recent years. And it's mostly uh, a consequence of the integration of manufacturing technology with computer technology. And when you, when you look at the uh, what's called mass customization, there's some interesting things. Vehicle models of automobiles in, in just a 20-year period, we've gone from 140 to 260. I'm sure there are a lot more now. I think it says in here somewhere there are more than uh, 300 different types of beer now. You even have uh, uh, you know, uh, Pop-Tarts. I didn't know there were 29 brands of Pop-Tarts um, as far as that mouthwashes, just all of that along the line. So if Joan Robinson or Edward Chamberlain would look at this, there would be shock and horror or shock and awe, I guess, and, and all the monopoly that's going. Ice cream and frozen yogurt, 556 brands. That's terrible. We've got to put an end to this. And so, uh, but what, all this is is, you know, the hyper-competitive global economy. Uh, you know, nowadays, and when this day, these data were collected, if you're making exceptional profits in any of these businesses, somebody from anywhere on the planet can step right in and compete with you. The capital markets are as fluid as they've ever been, and it's just really absurd to think that this is a sign of monopolization, uh, like, like Joan Robinson in the monopolistic competition crowd said. But you'll still see that comp monopolistic competition model in all the textbooks. Uh, now, the many firms uh, assumption, the many firms assumption of the standard theory. There's no reason to believe that you need a lot of firms, many firms, to have competition. Two is enough in many, in many cases. Uh, the early economists, the economists at the, the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, who were, who were opposed to antitrust, saw this very clearly. They saw that if you had uh, an industry with 15 firms and three or four or five of them they were superior and had lower costs than the rest and came to dominate the industry, they didn't see anything wrong with that. Uh, that they saw prices falling, uh, product levels expanding, product differentiation, new products, better products coming on the market. This is great. Uh, there's nothing antisocial about that. Um, and so uh, there's nothing necessarily magical about that. many firms, whatever many is. Uh, but uh, what, where this comes from, of course, is just this assumption that to have competition, the perfect competition model means many firms. Uh, one of the fatal flaws of this whole way of thinking, though, is that it doesn't say anything if, if you don't have many firms, if you just have a few, uh, why? What's the reason for this? Uh, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and still today among non-economists, it's assumed that there must be some sort of devious activity going on, collusion among these firms. That's why there are only a few dominating, not a lot. 
But the serious scholars who have looked at this, invariably, it's pretty simple. It's that whoever's at the top is just pleasing the consumer better than everybody else is. Uh, when, I, when I lived, I'll tell you one anecdote about this. When I lived in Chattanooga, Tennessee, there was a, a food chain there called the Red Food Chain. The food wasn't actually red. And I don't know why that name, they, they use a name, it was called Red Food. And, uh, but they, uh, uh, they, were, they competed with Kroger's, A&P, Food Lion, uh, a couple of these big warehouses, a BJ's Warehouse, something like this, um, Winn-Dixie, and, and, uh, and a lot of mom-and-pop grocery store type places. And Kroger shut down seven stores. Red Food said, we'll buy the seven stores, we'd like to buy the seven stores, and rehire your 400 employees who lost their jobs. So they did. And the Federal Trade Commission comes in and says, you can't do that. You already have 60% of the grocery market in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and everybody knows that's monopolistic. Uh, why? Because of our standard. Many firms, you know, it's too much concentration. And so they went to court. And uh, Red Food won in federal district court. Uh, and uh, lo and behold, what did they find? What did, what did the judge say? Uh, and the judge said that uh, uh, evidence was presented that the reason why Red Food had 60% of the market was that in the grocery industry, the only way to make money or more money than everybody else is to be better at pursuing a low margin strategy. That is, low profit margin on each can of peas. That is, you make less money on each can of peas. If you do that, you may well sell many more cans of peas than anybody else. And so, and that's what Red Food was just really good at doing. They, they, they had a lower profit margin per sale, but that enabled them to have so many more sales than all their competitors that they had 60% of the market. That, that, that was it, pretty much. They, they brought all these marketing experts from the University of Georgia and elsewhere in, and that's pretty much what they concluded. And then, uh, so Red Food won, and then about a month later, there was a, a headline in the paper saying that Red Food agrees to, to um, what do they call it, a, um, some kind of agreement with the FTC, um, consent, consent decree with the FTC. They consented to let the FTC sell their seven stores that they had bought from Kroger. And this must have been a gun under the table agreement. You know, you agree with me, don't you? And you're holding up 357 under the table. Uh, because the FTC obviously, I think, uh, threatened to keep them tied up in court at great expense for years and years with unlimited taxpayer-funded lawyers unless they consented. And so that's what happened. Uh, but it was all based on this phony idea that competition is determined by concentration, which, which it is not. Uh, more often than not, it's economies of scale that, that causes this. And w one final comment on uh, m the many firms assumption I'll make in my time's running out here is that there is some uh, research in economics uh, that looks at uh, one book in particular I'm thinking of by the same guy, Friedrich Scherer, that I mentioned, and a co-author named David Kamershen, who are both pretty good standard mainstream industrial organization economists I think it was published about 10 years ago, where they looked at hundreds of mergers uh, that took place in the United States. I forget how big their sample size was, but I think it was in the thousands of uh, mergers. And they found that over half of them, over about a 30 year, 30 or longer year period, over half of them were eventually spun off within 10 years. That is, these corporations. A, uh, a steel manufacturer might have bought up a hotel chain because uh, on the theory that when the steel industry is down, we're going to diversify so that we'll be making money in our hotel business even though we might be losing money temporarily during a recession in our steel business, something like that. Spun off, sold off, the merger didn't work. And they use this to make a case for more <coughs> government regulation of mergers. But, but really, the point I made earlier is that what this shows you is that uh, the market is the only way to find out what type of organization of industry works and what doesn't. And so all of this, all this really shows you is that, uh, you know, people are not omniscient. But uh, who are you going to trust more to make wise decisions about mergers? People who are putting their own money on the line or some bureaucrats at the Federal Trade Commission on a fixed salary and lifetime tenure in the government who have no stake at all in the business you know, should we rely on them to decide which mergers are good and which are not? And on top of that, they and their superiors are susceptible to being bribed by the corporations who lobby in Washington. 
you know, which is going to be most likely to be better for competition. Um, the final thing I want to uh, mention here in a few minutes I have left is the myth of output restriction. You know, you all know the standard model says the evil thing about monopoly is uh, they restrict output. Now, who knows how many baseball games professional baseball plays? Any baseball uh, fans here? How many games do they play? 162. Okay, obviously a monopolistic output restriction. Why not 262? Why do they quit at 162? Who, who knows who the, uh, the heavyweight boxing champ is right now? I don't really follow boxing anymore ever since Muhammad Ali retired, but uh, he, re he did retire, didn't he? <laughs> Well, if you don't know who the, the body, I guess is a room full of nerds. They don't know what the, uh, the <laughs> Lennox Lewis. How many times a year do you think he fights? Once or twice. Once or twice. Obviously, he's restricting God, but why didn't he fight once a week? Uh, on on the uh, Fox War Channel, I saw the uh, the Marines. The Marines in Iraq have Thursday night fights. You have the same guy fighting every Thursday night until he loses. They, you know, why does Lennox Lewis do this? Obviously, it's conspiracy and restraint of trade. Um, marriage is a restraint of trade. You know, uh, and there's there's a real real example. Uh, uh, I was at an antitrust conference some years ago, and a Federal Trade Commission uh, economist was explaining to us what the geniuses at the FTC were doing to save us from monopoly, and uh, and one of the examples he gave that stuck sticks in my mind was he said that the automobile dealers in the city of Detroit in the winter were closing down at 5 p.m. By 5 p.m. in the winter in Detroit it's pitch dark um, uh, there there are probably uh, you know crawling with criminals no customers cold as could be um, there's no business for automobile dealers to speak of I would think after 5 and it, right in the downtown inner city Detroit, uh, but and so uh, to me it sounded like a perfectly rational thing to do for them when the people are gone and the customers are gone, shut the lights, send people home, don't incur those costs for no reason. Uh, but he said no, obviously this is a restraint of trade. Uh, the, uh, they they were convinced this was a restraint of trade, but they all agreed they colluded to close down at five o'clock instead of nine o'clock. And so they're restricting output, and that's what the Federal Trade Commission was going to do. And so I asked him, does this mean that involuntary uh, servitude is a requirement for economic efficiency? I mean, after all, if you force these people to stay open until 9 o'clock, that's forced labor. You force them to stay at work. They choose to go home at 5 o'clock, but no, the government tells them you must stay at work until 9. It sounds like slavery to me. It's you know, some sort of form of slavery. And so uh, he didn't really have an answer to that. But that's really what it comes down to. If you look at, if you look at this article that uh, output restriction is, is, uh, is uh, some sort of dangerous thing caused by monopolies, uh, it, it, it's kind of absurd when you think about it. And besides that, output is, is not restricted. If one industry uh, does, or one firm in an industry does, restrict output below what it could be producing, well, those resources that are not being used, the labor, capital, the technology, is used somewhere else. And so there's going to be an output expansion somewhere else. So if you look at it economy-wide, any uh, reduction in production here will lead to an expansion in production somewhere else. So economy-wide, there's no, in any kind of logical sense, output restriction. It's just if you look in this narrow or myopic sense, you can make that argument. And so, uh, and, and finally, the final thing I'll say, we're out of time. When you think about it, the, about collusion, this whole idea of collusion as a, a thing that creates monopoly, well, the very existence of a corporation is a pooling of assets. People combine, they collude, they pool their assets to, uh, to form a corporation. When you have a merger, all you have is they're bringing on more partners in the pooling of assets. There's no collusion going on here. They're just doing more of the same thing they did to create the corporation in the first place. And so, but it's, it's taken on a sort of an insidious type of uh, implication. But I think I, uh, I talked a little too much. It's a big topic. Uh, I, I'd like to ask, uh, leave time for questions, but we're out. But I'll stand around here for 10 minutes if you have questions. Okay. And that's it. Thanks. What's that? Uh, what's that? 
Oh, yeah, we did start about it. Well, I'll take questions then. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was 2.30. I lost track of time. I, I, I went to the Walter Block School of Arithmetic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I live, I live yeah. in Chattanooga uh, most of my life, man. I was, I was wondering, is that why they eventually switched over to Philo? Because I know they had a number of locations. Yeah, but yeah they had, uh, what happened with this antitrust case I mentioned was um, the, the Federal Trade Commission came in and said, uh, we will sell these stores, these Kroger stores that you bought for you uh, if you can't sell them in a year. They gave uh, Red Food one year to sell them. And of course, they got one offer a a after 11 months. It was a lowball offer, which they said no thanks to. So the Federal Trade Commission said, we well, if you can't sell them in 12 months, we will sell them for you. They sold them to Bilo, whatever Bilo was, for Red Food. And I'm sure they didn't get the deal that Red Food would have got for itself because you had government bureaucrats with no personal financial stake in the matter at all uh, doing the transaction. So that's why they're Bilo or what, whatever it is. Uh, I was there last spring because I still have some friends there and I, I went to visit. But, uh, but that's, that's what happened to, uh, to those. I've, I've always but, wondered what happened. Uh, yeah, the, uh, yeah the, the, uh, the actual decision, I read the decision, it was a federal district court judge in Atlanta, and uh, I forget her name, it was a woman judge, and uh, it was, you know, one of the best decisions I've ever seen in any trust case. You know, just clear logic. She said, well, let me get this straight. They, they opened up seven stores that had been shut down, and the government is arguing this is an output restriction. They hired 400 people who had lost their jobs, and that is an output restriction. That's a restriction in competition. There are seven more stores operating in the city now, and that's, that's, that's bad for competition. It'd be good for competition if we had seven fewer stores in town, right? And, and so she, she pretty much said, get out of town to the FTC. But then, you know, the government has virtually unlimited uh, lawyers at taxpayers' expense to keep, you know, and they were obviously uh, uh, really pissed off that they lost the case because they picked, you know, tiny little red food in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And here's the full power of the same government that, that almost, took Microsoft apart, you know, recently. So, and they, and they lost. They lost tiny little red food. And so they must have been really pissed off at that. And so they, they threatened. They had to threaten to keep, to keep them, keep harassing them. Because the, uh, the CEO of Red Food just said, the heck with it, I'm, you know, he gave up. He let them do what they wanted to with him. But uh, I think you had your hand up next. Yeah. Um, what happens in industries that are uh, very high entry costs? Um, like what? Is there any competition process in, say, a, 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 a local water industry that has pipes running throughout the city or a uh, local telephone company that is the only one with telephone lines? I mean, obviously, yeah. you mentioned a cell phone, that one down. But yeah. Well, those are, those industries, those, those are the so-called uh, natural monopoly industries that you, uh, you mentioned, uh, water, uh, and uh, you can, I have an article in the, um, the uh, Review of Boston Economics, I forget the exact date now, it's uh, probably five or six years ago, called The Myth of Natural Monopoly. And what I did was I looked at the origins of this whole argument, that the, the argument of natural monopoly is that there are certain industries with uh, heavy fixed costs, such as natural gas, water supply, uh, that will tend to have uh, one firm develop a very low cost per unit, long run cost per unit, and become a monopoly and therefore price everybody out of the market. And then once everybody's out of the market, they'll charge monopolistic prices. That's the theory of natural monopoly. Uh, but um, one of the things, when I read these theories, I, I always look for evidence. I don't know, it's just me, I guess. I'm uh, naturally suspicious of these things. But uh, I've, ne I've never seen any uh, real history about what had happened in the actual American natural gas industry. Sure enough, there are a lot of books on this that tell you that at the time this was all happening, in the late 19th, early 20th century, when these industries were being invented, you know, electricity you know, didn't, you know, came along you know, around then, there was vigorous competition among uh, phone companies. Some cities had several dozen competing phone companies. Baltimore, there's a little book I dug up called the, the Baltimore Gas and Electric Company that was about the origins of the gas and electric in the city of Baltimore. And uh, what happened was there were competing uh, firms producing water supply, natural gas. They were figuring out ways to, 
to uh, get around problems of infrastructure and digging up all the streets and everything they were they were working. And at the same time, though, they were constantly lobbying the legislature to limit competition. And, uh, and they were constantly trying to form cartels to limit competition on their own, but they never could. Cartels are inherently unstable. They had trouble. And so what happened was they eventually uh, convinced the legislature in Maryland to create one big monopoly in the electric light business. And now it's called Baltimore Gas and Electric Company. And that existed for uh, some 100 years uh, or so. And the same thing happened in every other city. And so there was there, the history of it, the real history of it was there was vigorous competition until the government stepped in and created all these monopolies. They're not natural at all. Um, the telephone business in America. In World War I, the, U, the federal government nationalized telephone. Just like Abraham Lincoln censored the telegraph in the Civil War, uh, in World War I, the U.S. government nationalized uh, the telephone for the same reason, to censor communication. Then after World War I was over, uh, what they did is they did not privatize it. They did not give it back to the private sector. Uh, they did sort of, but they, they gave each state the right to regulate a telephone monopoly within the state. And, and, they, and AT&T was the company that won, that lobbied and won this monopoly. There were many competing phone companies at the time, but uh, AT&T uh, happened to be the one that uh, was the best at bribing the politicians into giving them one big phone monopoly. So that, that's how we got all these so-called natural monopolies through the unnatural process of politics. And uh, it's hard to imagine now, if you look today, if you look outside and you see the wires for the electric power wires, it's hard to imagine what competition would look like. But there's also, there's an economist named Walter Primo, P-R-I-M-E-A-U is how it's spelled. And he wrote a book called Electric Utility uh, Deregulation, I think is the name of it. I think that's the name of it. And one of the things he did, he's, did, he's published a lot of articles over during the 1970s and 80s, uh, statistical studies of competition within electric power industry. And to the surprise of most people who have ever thought about this, there are dozens of cities in America who have always had competing electric power producers. Not, not one producer with the east side of town and another producer with the west side of town, but competing over all the business within a town. And uh, surprise, surprise, he found that wherever that competition existed, there were lower prices and better service. Uh, whereas the natural monopoly theory would predict the opposite. They would say, oh, no, they, you, need, you need to have a regulated monopoly to have lower prices and better service. You didn't find that. The same is true in cable TV. Thomas Hazlett has written many articles and probably a book, uh, uh, I suppose, because he's written a lot of articles on cable regulation. And the same thing is true. There are dozens of cities who have always had competition in cable. Satellite and everything now has pretty much made the cable monopoly defunct as a monopoly. But before satellite came around, there were dozens of cities in America who did not have monopoly franchises for cable either. And sure enough, uh, Hazlett uh, found in a long series of articles in the Journal of Law and Economics and elsewhere, lower prices, better service, more channels, if there's just a little bit of competition that is allowed by the government. And so uh, well, that's, that's my answer to that. I think you had your hand up next, in the, down to blue, back, back there. Yeah. yeah. Um, what's your view on how intellectual property rights enforced by the government affect the Intellectual property, that's a tough question. You have to ask Walter Block that one. Uh, <laughs> uh, intellect, uh, like what in particular are you uh, well, thinking? Copyright and patent law. <coughs> well, patents, <clears throat> the, whole, the whole idea behind patent law, of course, is to create monopolies. And uh, Murray Rothbard's position on that was, uh, was that uh, it was sort of as unjust because if you and I invent some device that's identical, uh, say you're Edward Chamberlain and I'm Joan Robinson, and uh, we write the exact same book, which they pretty much did, and uh, books aren't patentable, but say, say we had some invention, some product, and you get to the patent office two minutes before I do, you get a 20-year a, a monopoly and I get nothing. And so uh, that, that's what he had to say about it. But all I'll do in the time we have is recommend that you read uh, uh, Stefan Kinsella's article about it in the Journal of Libertarian Studies about two years ago. I think it's sort of uh, uh, one of the most important articles uh, written in a long, long time on the whole issue of intellectual property. 
It's K-I-N-S-E-L-L-A is how the name is uh, spelled, Stephen Kinsella. It's, it's a big, long, convoluted argument. He's a, an intellectual property patent attorney who does not believe in intellectual property patents. And so he does, he does this for a living. He has a background in uh, uh, electrical engineering and a law degree. He's a lawyer. And so he can understand all these real high-tech uh, industry patents. And he makes his money that way, but he thinks the whole thing is a big fraud, <laughs> pretty much. Uh, but uh, I, oh, I think this. Sorry, I think this man had his hand up, and then and then you. Okay, I'm trying to keep track of first come first. So you had your. Oh, okay. Then you then you can. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, this is a theory that uh, copyright should be better used to protect intellectual property in case of uh, technological invention, whereas patents should be better used to protect intellectual property rights in case of literary or written innovations or literary. Yeah. Yeah, well, Rothbard was co treated copyright different yeah, than uh, yeah, patents, for sure. Copyright is, is a different ball game. Yeah, I, I'll just recite his idea. But th this is a, you know, there is not, there is no one set answer. There's not an Austrian answer to this sort of thing. Uh, uh, I would just, I'll just refer you to the people who seem to have done the most thinking about it, and that's, uh, and which I haven't. And so, but the Kinsella article is where to is where to go if you really want to educate yourself. Don't listen to what I have to say about it, because that's but Kinsella is the real expert uh, on this. Uh, so I would find his article. Yeah, Rothbard treated copyrights differently than uh, patents. But, uh, any other questions, uh, comments? Piracy. What's that? Piracy. Piracy. Yeah, what about it? <laughs> Theft? Uh, mostly against it, I guess, yeah. Piracy. <laughs> uh, what, 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 what in particular? What kind of piracy? What do you mean? Any piracy? I, I was going to ask you about the copyright. No. Oh. Um, uh, well, I think you'd have to be specific. Give me a specific ex example, like piracy. If if you're floating down the Chattahoochee River <laughs> and I and I sink your boat and take your wallet, I'm against that. <laughs> I don't think you should do that. <laughs> But, uh, but uh, yeah, that's. But I just bought a T-shirt. Uh, a, I was at the beach, and a teacher said uh, "piracy," and then below it it said "hostile takeovers without the paperwork." <laughs> and so uh, I'm not sure what that means, but that's, uh, I have a T-shirt that says that on there. But uh, the the heavy hand of Mark Thornton is telling us to quit, so we're out of, out of time. <laughs>